Monica, thank you so much for those lovely words. And um, it's a pleasure to be here. This is my um, second visit and my first chance to um, present to a group. And uh, so after all of those thousands and thousands of children that I survey, I'm just going to talk today about 28. Um, and um, I hope that it uh, uh, resonates more widely. So is this, is this sounding OK? Yeah, this is cool. All right, great. Um, so, I've got notes because I want to try and stay to time and stay on focus, and I want to try and distill a sense of the theme that runs through this book, which was, um, which is an ethno ethno ethnographic study, <laughs> um, ethnographic study of just this one class, and I may need to explain a little bit about how classes work in Britain. But at the age of 13 or 14, um, these 28 kids had been together for three years, even though they went in their different directions for different subjects. But they had a kind of identity. And that identity was where we began the ethnography, um, uh, spending time in their lives. I wanted to understand how the digital technologies that are, that, that are occupying so much of their lives seemingly are kind of interwoven through the fabric of their social, their personal, and their learning lives. And that kind of metaphor of a thread through the fabric of their lives um, kind of guides guides the book. And I think as a social psychologist, I always hear the tension between the social and the psych and the kind of, the, you know, how do we understand the individual within the social? How do we understand the way the social is made up of the uh, activities, public and private, of the uh, individuals? But as a media researcher, which I've become more um, in, in the last, I don't know, 10, 20 years, um, much more, I've wanted to put those questions into a more multidisciplinary space, and I've wanted to um, think about how the media thread through people's lives, as it were, precisely by decentering the media, precisely by not always looking for the media in every situation, but looking to see where people's lives touch or are becoming dependent on or getting kind of somehow uh, reshaped by um, the media. So the digital age you should take with scare quotes in the title. It's a little bit of um, rhetoric to um, uh, maybe sell a book. And... Um, <laughs> um, and so maybe if I just take this image as a way of um, thinking through Monica, this is probably one of yours, I can't remember. Monica has found, saw so many fabulous um, images uh, for me over, <laughs> over the time that we've worked together. So in the class, we wanted to kind of position ourselves within the structures and practices that shape um, children's lives and listen to how they talk about their lives and their agency um, within this. And the question I would ask here that kind of guides um, the way I think is whether this is a picture of children using mobile technology or whether this is a, a picture of children enjoying themselves face to face with mobile technology, as it were. So the, the pleasure, I think, is about the, the co-located face-to-face situation. The mobile is part of that, is crucial to it, um, but is not marking a transformation from the kind of social scene that we remember from our own um, childhoods. And that kind of double way of seeing this image allows me to, um, I think, kind of see the digital partly as a rhetoric and partly as something that is the beginning of an inquiry about how children are, are making sense of the, of, the, of the technologies and weaving it into their stories. So as you can see from my um, header, um, and I'll just put up a, a random um, snapshot of um, uh, a DML slide. I think everyone here will know the um, MacArthur Foundation's um, Digital Media and Learning Initiative. This is just to kind of convey the enormous diversity of the work that that network does. And within that, um, the class is part of the Connected Learning Research Network, which um, Mimi Ito um, uh, is leading and has spent um, uh, the past five or so years, really trying to think about the way in which connected learning as a concept can help us to capture the way in which um, the different spaces of children and young people's lives um, might be better connected uh, for better learning, for um, uh, social justice ends, uh, in order to bring um, overcome various forms of disadvantage. And as you will hear, of course, that question of what counts as better learning um, is uh, the point of the, in a way, of the, of the contestation. What I felt when I 
joined the network was um, while a lot of the work was very insp inspiring and um, innovative in kind of mapping out new kinds of pathways and new ways in which digital media could uh, scaffold different kinds of learning. Often the children and young people that get featured are kind of exceptional and extraordinary and they're the hackers, they're the creators, they're the kind of most, um, they're the leading edge of what could happen. And I think I wanted to study a class which is, in a way, pitched as a kind of regular class, um, because I wanted to kind of understand, well, what does that mean for ordinary kids, average kids? All of these words have to have scare quotes today, but um, I just wanted to understand how that kind of exceptionalism might um, uh, be visible if you just walk into any class, um, any classroom, and still to ask the same questions. How could connected learning open up new kinds of opportunities? What differences um, might that um, make? So while this is where the work was positioned, I'd just say a word or two about um, my kind of theoretical framework. And I've decided that um, I'll illustrate the dilemmas of late modernity with a joke, um, not to get too serious about theory. This is my currently favorite joke. And I use it to capture the sense of uncertainties and tensions about the world that we have created for ourselves, and what I see as a kind of one of the really fascinating things about um, Anthony Giddens and Ulrich Beck's notions of late modernity or reflexive modernity is that we are really now grappling with circumstances in a sense that we have created, risks that we have created, um, structures that we and pressures that we have created. But for children, they are still growing up in a world that is not primarily of their own um, making. It is um, a world that the adults around them, in their anxieties, in their competitive pressures, and yet in their sense that they can move freely away from the traditions that they were brought up in, um, is kind of opening up new uh, kinds of possibilities. And of course, one of the things that we see, one of the ways that makes modernity so reflexive now is the role of the media in telling stories for all of us about the world that we are embedded in and providing narratives and a kind of imagination about the world um, that, we are, that we are in. So from the kind of uh, exciting and extraordinary and anxious imaginary of what the digital could be doing to our world, um, to, as it were, a deeply ordinary playground in a pretty kind of ordinary school where children um, actually live, though they live both here and in the imagination. Um, and what we know about these young people, perhaps compared with the way in which we were um, children, is that they are living in a world where the um, transitions are, are, um, are moving forward uh, towards greater uncertainties and flexibility. Further reconstruction of the family, further competitive pressures on schools, extended transition to adulthood, greater uncertainties about work and employment, heightened ambitions in a kind of celebrity culture about who they could be. We know that a, a whole series of trends that have been in the making for um, decades or generations are kind of intensified um, for, these, for these young people. And one of the reasons I like um, Ulrich Beck, who I write a lot about in the, in the book, is he describes our society's fascination with children as the kind of last place of enchantment, as it were, the last, the last possibility in our cynical lives for us to invest something with hope. And um, I think when we, we hear the intense debates that go on around children and childhood and what they could be and what education should provide, it comes with a level of a kind of intense anxiety and a desire to control and invest in the future. Anthony Giddens talks about our desire to colonize the future and the present, um, precisely because um, cynical though we are about many other things, um, we still have hopes for our children. And so we have smaller families. Um, we try to give children the best of everything. We try to respect their rights in what Anthony Giddens calls the newly democratized family. That gives rise to all kinds of um, dilemmas of being overindulgent or um, wondering where parents' rights fit in. We try to keep them indoors and wrap them in cotton wool to keep them safe. Then we worry about their resilience because we're not pushing them out. Um, we try to push them to learn violin and coding and so on to get ahead. And then we remember nostalgia that we used to get muddy all day and our parents didn't know where we were and why can't we? So we just, it, there is a lot of uncertainty and tension around how we um, even um, think about children. 
So within all of that kind of um, framing and set of um, theoretical concerns um, to the lives, as it were, of 28 of these kids and the way in which we framed a project. And the project is kind of designed, I'm just checking out the, the slide looks, because somewhere around the three spaces that I see as the three key spheres of children's lives, I've drawn a kind of a cloud, which is labeled the digital. I think I need my cloud to be a little more visible. The structures of children's lives. Children essentially grow up in relation to their family and home, in relation to their school and um, questions of learning um, and the peer group and the locale. And that really kind of tells, that says quite a lot about um, what are the possibilities for young people. But now the digital, as I've said, is a cloud around or a thread um, running through. And so in designing the project, we said, OK, we're going to kind of take a turn around these phases. And we designed the project in a way that began um, a little at a distance from the kids to give us time to learn them and kind of went deeper and deeper into their lives. So we designed a project where we spent some time identifying, um, I can't say um, a typical school, but identifying um, a school in which um, uh, as in all London um, suburban schools, and probably I think in New York, there was a kind of um, a great um, mixing of different kinds of lives and different kinds of um, life circumstances. We spent a term, we spent about three or four months in the class, in the school, with the kids sitting at the back on those tiny weenie chairs, and <laughs> not too tiny because they were 13, but still um, uh, trying to. Um, uh, listening to how the lessons unfolded, um, chatting to the kids in the playground, going to lunch with them, walking home with them, and so on. We spent uh, the next three months focused on the home and family, uh, visiting them all at home, um, talking to their parents, talking to their siblings, meeting their pets, um, seeing what they... Um, uh, looking at how they'd kind of kitted out their bedrooms. And then we tried to kind of spend time in the peer group and also online and kind of pursue really wherever their interests took them and therefore um, could uh, take us. What's interesting about this map is that though even though we recognise it intellectually, the school never goes home or rarely goes home with the kids. And the kid the Parents rarely see what happens in the school. So the children link the circles, and the digital could link the circles, the spheres of their lives. And we, for one year of their life, also went into all those spaces. But where, where, as we moved through, we heard all this kind of myth and uncertainty from the teachers about the supposed mess and muddle of what home life looked like from parents about the kind of uncertain uh, rules and disciplines and um, uh, learning curricula that went on in the school. Um, and uh, the disconnection, um, I think, is something that uh, became very significant in thinking about the, the lives of these children. So another way of drawing what I thought of as their small world, and their small world really is a small world, is um, by just putting them on a, a, a schematic map. So a London suburb, I think, is not maybe like a New York suburb, but it's not like your typical American suburb because it is defined by the ability to walk between houses and walk between shops and public transport, So, and children can't drive cars anyway. Um, so uh, to walk from where one child lived to the extreme opposite might take you about 45 minutes or perhaps an hour. It's that kind of scale. And the school is in the middle. Um, Within these few square miles, uh, people spoke um, many different languages. I think all the world's religions were there. Um, typical of London, typical, I think, of our global cities, the uh, millionaire's child and the refugee's child kind of sit next to each other in the classroom. It's an extraordinary mixing of people. But um, as is definitely typical of Britain, the, the railway line and major road that divides the scene um, absolutely defines um, middle-class children who live here in the area with the school and the park and the better housing and poorer children who live over here um, with um, much uh, fewer resources. So, 
So what I'd like to do in the, in the time, what, what we do in the book is we tell a, a number of different kind of um, slices through uh, the children's lives, as it were, um, in order to explore where the connections are and where it is that the children make the connections or the adults make the connections or indeed the digital media use makes um, the connections. Uh, and there are really two themes that I want to bring out. And one is the idea that where those connections could be beneficial for young people, they're very often missed. So what we have is a kind of story of missed opportunities. And the other story I'd like to, the, the other theme I'd like to bring out is that from children's point of view, many of those connections um, and opportunities on offer don't look so beneficial to them. And so they are often invested in creating what they, th what we came to think of as positive disconnections, uh, the desire to um, disconnect. So let me um, kind of move you into, I give you a bit of a feel of the um, field work. So here's their classroom, where the class arrived every day um, at um, 8.15 and began the day. Here's the smart board that contains, that gives out data and um, collects data. Uh, and every uh, school has a smart board at the front. So we arrived every, we tried to arrive many mornings with the kids. Of course, they arrived every morning. Everyone was a bit sleepy. Um, everyone was uh, feeling that kind of pressured moment of moving from pajamas to school uniform. British children all have to wear the same school uniform. The teacher stood at the entrance to every um, classroom, checking on uh, the length of socks and the length of skirts and the presence of nail varnish and the height of heels and whether things were tucked in or... So there was a kind of sense of, I was all, I was the same time, not only running my department, but surveying 25,142 children across Europe. So I was like, whoa. But um, <laughs> so were the kids, is my point, because they were, um, you know, tucking in as they arrived. Um, so, for example, Fesse was usually late because he was a bit um, uh, uh, dozy and he played his Xbox till late every night. Um, and his sister had to kick him out of the house to get him to school because I don't know where the mum was or dad. Um, Salma used to arrive neat and calm. She texted her friends. They'd met at the agreed location. They'd walked to school together. They were kind of very um, coordinated. The kids sat in these desks, which might seem to allow for group work, but in fact, they all they f spent most of the day facing the smart screen because the smart, the smart board has reorganized the classroom back to being a kind of one-to-many format and away from the uh, possibility of group work and, and, and interaction. And the teachers were at the stage of trying to get a lot of YouTube clips in and online stuff in, but it didn't always work very well and they tended to use the um, digital media as a window on the world, which you could see that might be quite literally, even though the media studies class was trying to teach the kids to deconstruct those very same digital um, media. And immediately there were all kinds of connections and disconnections that arose in our minds as researchers that were not really visible to the um, teachers. So, for example, Fesse, who seemed a bit um, dozy, we knew was creatively learning um, music at home with his guitar and his um, watching uh, tutorials on YouTube to get the next, um, to get his next uh, chord structure or um, performance right. The teacher clearly had no idea that Fesse thought of himself as musical or was indeed trying to learn. So there was a kind of an immediate um, disconnect. Giselle, who was um, one of the kind of middle class um, labelled gifted and talented girls, had a teacher who was actively trying to teach against the ethos of the school. So the school was kind of grades and learn this in, in order and achieve and perform and get your um, reward. And she was being taught free and relaxed and forget about grades and forget about systems. And so that was m even more of a disconnect. That was a kind of determined um, disconnect. Walking home from school, um, uh, Julian and I figured out quite quickly was a time when we had to make sure that we were there um, because walking home was a kind of slow period when the, the kids, as it were, decompressed again and they used to drag out that journey because it was precisely the space between the scrutiny of the teachers and the control of the parents. 
So um, Giselle described it as a slow journey. Um, and she didn't live very far, but she made it slow. And Abby said, well, we'll just go shopping or we'll go to the park or we'll do anything really that we feel like doing. So yes, when she and her friends walked home, they had their phone in their hands and they checked their messages and they checked their updates. But the real point was, like my image at the start, they were walking home together and they were doing what they felt like face to face. Um, footnote, alone together. Um, <laughs> So when we got home, home is a much um, messier and more chaotic place. And even though each child only lives in one of these um, scenes, um, what happened at home was much more flexible, of course. Homework was often accompanied by Facebook, which was a bit of a distraction, but also a way of getting some guidance in maths or French. Nick would quickly start playing computer games with the kids that he'd spent all day with. Giselle would go on her family's Minecraft server, where she had a kind of senior role in uh, organizing others. Uh, Adam would get immersed in a multiplayer game where, with people he'd never met and had no connection with school, and that was precisely the point for him, because then he felt he could really be himself. Abby would join a world of extended family and people kind of coming in and banging doors and everyone playing music and everyone talking, and that was her world. Megan would go into a kind of private space on Tumblr, and hours would pass by in which she was just perfecting a kind of um, uh, space um, of imagination for herself. Max, Jenna, and Alice would gather together at Alice's house because Max's house was a bit cold and lonely and Jenna's house was a bit difficult. So Alice would kind of provide the space and they would all share their Harry Potter fandom um, with great uh, relish and completely forget about school. And Shane, who was a kind of classic learning to labor boy in um, Paul Willis's sense, um, would get on his bike and go out. And um, Fair enough. And then at various points in the evening, the, fa the parents would come by and try to draw them together as a family. And there would be a, we're going to be a family together now moment. And that would be a moment very often in front of the television. Um, and it would be a moment when people talked and shared or just at least tolerated each other for a while. And then they'd all go back in their um, separate directions. So my point is, um, and the ordinary diversity I'm trying to capture of teenagers' lives is threaded through with the digital media, but not really centrally about them, except insofar as they offer certain kinds of connections and disconnections that can be meaningful um, or frustrating. And I've also wanted to illustrate that it's not that this is a generation, as is commonly said, and I'm sure you already know, but this is not a generation that is just desperate to be constantly plugged in to, the, um, to displace all kinds of face-to-face um, -face or uh, human interaction, but rather what they want is the choice when to connect and when to disconnect. And the digital media provide them with a kind of tool for that kind of agency, a way of choosing not to listen to bossy parents or annoying younger siblings or critical teachers, a way of choosing to connect with sympathetic friends or not to miss out on the ongoing peer drama. Footnote, Boyd. Um, and the overriding importance of agency, I think, is what's shown also by their choice. And we could see them making a, a choice in many very, very micro ways um, to escape what you could see as a kind of growing digital embrace of the school. Um, and where the school, where the teachers are trying to find new ways to use digital media in class and to reach out from the school to the home to connect with parents or with the children by um, email or the intranet. So often when children were, when the teachers were doing, um, showing digital media, some kind of form of, of, of effort to connect, the students would start whispering to each other or acting, for example, as if they had no idea that the maths teacher had posted maths exercises on her blog so that they could do the maths exercises. When they got home, they just said, sorry, no idea what you're talking about. So digital devices are not only becoming um, teens' way of kind of choosing to connect or disconnect according to uh, their kind of agentic um, desires, but also adults' way of trying to reach out and engage young people in ways that they think young people should be um, spending their time. So, this is a photograph we took in Yusuf's home. And 
Yosef was um, the eldest of four children of a devout Muslim family who had emigrated from East Africa when he was little. His father had been a trained nurse, but in London could only get a low level of work, which is a common situation. His mother spoke very limited English. Actually, one of the kind of fascinating side stories in the book was how many parents could not really communicate very well with some of their children, which I think is something we, we don't give, and certainly could not communicate with the teachers, which we, a story we know better. So at school, we saw Yusuf being a kind of quiet boy a bit on the side, um, and he worked conscientiously and well and seemed to be doing uh, well in maths and science. When we visited at home, we walked into a very kind of highly structured educational environment in which two learning practices took up nearly all his spare time. One was going to Quran school twice a week, in which he did a lot of rote learning in Arabic, which he didn't always understand, and a kind of interesting, more open moral discussion of social and moral issues. And his progress was measured by learning the surahs, the, ver the, the verses of the Quran, off by heart. Second, and remarkably similar to, to that in a way, his father had bought a very expensive set of CDs that had maths, staged learning for maths and English, um, on which they'd spent about £3,000, which is $5,000. It's a lot of money. This is a really um, poor family. Um, and the CDs provided the graded activities that linked to these um, charts, all of which are headed, if you can see it, the ladder of success. And this was, these were arranged in a room along with various kind of certificates of achievement in a bedroom which had been turned in the home into a kind of classroom and the father described himself as a head teacher at home and the, and the children, the four children, had to work their way through and chart their success. So one of the things that was interesting to us about this was that both the structuring of learning in the Quran school and the structuring of the learning through the home technology mirrored the way in which, mirrored the kind of generation of quantified indicators of learning and success which the school itself was uh, implementing. So uh, Yusuf lived in a kind of seamless, uh, th that for him things were connected in a way that I at least judged as relatively um, problematic. Problematic, why? One, because the school didn't know that this is what was happening in his home. They just kind of had this way of being rather critical of the way children's homes might be organised, the spaces of chaos where homework never got done and families, parents didn't do what the school wanted them to do. Um, also because it wasn't apparent how one could see whether this was working and whether this was the, as it were, the optimal or indeed interesting things for Yosef um, to learn. But when we got to the school, these kinds of charts, of course, were all over the school as well. So here's an example of the way in which um, I just took lots of pictures every time I was in the school. There was a lot of kind of exhortation to raise your level um, coming from the school to the children and explanations of how exactly to raise your level. And then here's an example of how artwork can be, as it were, leveled. Um, and the levelling metaphor was given by the government uh, as a way of measuring progress within um, the school curriculum. It was implemented through the School Information Management System, which is SIMS, which is in Britain the biggest um, system that encodes the stages of levels that every child has reached. And it was discursively implemented among the children and the teachers. It became the language by which learning was discussed. So a teacher said to a student, for example, not have you done your art or how are you getting on with your art or did you enjoy painting that, but have you been levelled for art yet? That was the kind of conversation that went on and the students would give answers like, yes, I got 7B, but I'm hoping for 8A next term. And that was, you know, it was a, a thorough kind of encoding of the language of the system. And so if I were to go back to the picture of the classroom next to the smart screen where the teacher had her computer, she, the teachers would spend a lot of time each day um, as were listening for what the, children, what the students were saying and turning it into data points that could then be entered into the system so that every child would get several data points per class or certainly by the end of the day um, in which um, their progress academically in all the different subjects and their behaviour could be um, entered. So what teachers are telling me is that 
Uh, this was the national. This is the national system, but this school did it particularly effectively. So, if you like, it's the leading edge of what it is that um, could be done with uh, um, a, a digital system of uh, quantifying uh, progress. Of course, what the system did, and um, I know Monica has uh, thought about this and might want to ask questions, but it allowed for a surveillance of the children. Um, it allowed also, of course, for a surveillance of the teachers, because if they didn't fill it out, well, then they could also be um, judged. And most importantly, it made learning um, instrumentalized. So to be very um, uh, obvious about it, if it could be leveled, then it counted um, both literally and um, metaphorically. So uh, Giselle, who was not learning music according to the formal grade system, did not learn music from the point of view of the school because she couldn't be entered into the system. Um, Yosef, who was learning on a system of, of progress and charts, wasn't learning on the right system and therefore his home knowledge also didn't count because it couldn't be entered into the system. If a child learned piano on the proper grade system, it could be entered in and it was. And then it kind of became part of the school's purview of what it was that children were learning. And the very um, first time that we met everyone actually was at the parent-teacher, do you call it a conference, the parent-teacher conference, um, which happened very near the start of our fieldwork and we met them all and we realized after a while that what we were hearing in the conversation between the parent and the teacher with the child sometimes chipping in was a negotiation about whether what the child did in the rest of their life could be entered into, the, could, could count. Um, what were their interests and were they generating some kind of codified um, progress markers? Um, and if not, could they be brought within the system so that the school would look better and the child would show up better and everyone would kind of... So these, they were some quite extraordinary conversations. What was surprising to us as we got to know the, um, the uh, families better was that by and large they liked it. People were happy with this system. And that, for me, was the kind of big, oh my god, um, what's going on moment. You won't be surprised that Yosef's father liked that standardized system, but so did lots of others. So Salma said, it's quite good. They keep you on track. So you, you know if you're going on track, all your levels, they know your levels, they know what you have to do to boost it. You know if you're doing good. It's good they have all that information. Middle class, Adriana's dad reflecting kind of tacitly on the very mixed makeup of the composition of the school, said, given the kind of school it is, you can hear middle class dad, given the kind of school it is and the kind of intake it has, you know, they have to be fair and they can't just selectively treat children differently. So they have to um, and let others do as they like. So they have to. It's, it's a system that seemed fair. So while we wanted to ask, and I still in, uh, to argue, and in some ways I still do, that the school exemplified this kind of um, inexorable logic of a system of surveillance and control, imposing a relentless regime of discipline and standardized learning, the fact that the families liked it sent me going back to um, the theories of reflexive modernity that I began with. It sent me to go back and think again about what it's like to grow up in an individualized society where the risks are worrying and seem very kind of present and the traditions that are going to hold you into a secure role and future um, seem very uncertain. And it made me ask again um, some questions about the whole connected learning enterprise, which, as it were, is about taking a risk, find innovating with learning and trying to find new kinds of models and new possibilities. And often where those systems seem very exciting is in the learning, and often where they become unstuck is in the questions of assessment that go along with that and kind of external recognition. And so I began to wonder, what are we, what are we asking of these risk-averse parents and these... Um, children who feel burdened with their, their futures um, when we ask them to kind of stand outside this beautifully organized, all-containing system, as long as you don't mind that it leaves out a lot of your um, real interests. So I have two more stories and a conclusion. So looking at the time, I think I probably have five minutes. OK, one story and a conclusion. Okay. So one of the, the thing, one of the nice things about an ethnography is that you're in the 
um, in the children's lives for an extended period, so you can kind of see how things unfold over time. And one thing that unfolded over over the time took actually um, it took two years of the children's lives, but it began in the year that we were with them. And this was the um, world challenge which I kind of fastened upon as um, something that seemed to be exactly what you would want of, or, or one way you might design um, a, a system of connected learning. So this was a, an offer from a commercial group, a commercial organization, that offered to the whole year group um, of 13 and 14 year olds the chance to raise funds over the course of a year uh, in order to go to Malaysia on a trip to see the rainforest um, and see the lives of people in developing countries um, and uh, enjoy an amazing journey of self-discovery. Um, and the idea was, as it were, that it would connect the small world of the class with the globe. It would put the children in touch with other children in other schools all around um, the world undertaking this challenge to raise the money, and then it would give everyone the chance to go and see how children live in developing countries and make a difference. So at the, near the start of the year, this offer was made to the 250 children in the year group. Um, about one third of our class entered the competition by which they, they wrote a letter to say why they really wanted to do this and how they would raise the money. Um, the money was about um, £2,000, which is a lot of money for any 13-year-old to spend on a trip and an impossible sum, I would say, for um, many of the families. Um, and somehow the teacher who made a series of decisions about who would get selected um, ended up selecting the middle-class white kids out of my very mixed class, which was... Um, and one whole thread through the book, which I'm not dwelling on here, is about the, the, the quiet and repeated processes of social reproduction, which um, undercut the social justice dimension of uh, digital learning. But if I just focus on the kind of the digital dimension, the idea was that the participants would connect with each other locally and globally. They would share and coordinate activities, monitor progress with more charts. Um, establish various digital networks, emails for among the participants and the teacher, an intranet to record their progress and their funds raised and targets and so forth. You could imagine. What we saw just kind of encapsulated the ways in which, um, in small ways, with their feet, children and indeed teachers vote to disconnect rather than to um, connect. So a whole host of little little moments when I know, the teacher tried to demonstrate this website to the kids one day and the school's internet went down. That was it for the meeting for the week, you know, and then they will have to come back next week. Another day, we all turned up again and she'd forgotten her password, so she couldn't get onto the um, internet. Um, she then posted minutes on the school's intranet, which she thought was very helpful for the teachers, for the students and the parents, but none of the students or parents knew how to access that. Um, and so on. What's important, I think, is that we've, through my description of the school's information management system, we've just seen that this is a school that can manage technology um, very well and indeed better than many other schools um, are managing. So if this site is not working very well, if they're not making it support the children's mobilization, the world challenge, there is something um, less about skill and more about will, more about how people are choosing to allow the technology to underpin their activities. Because even though the digital side of the world challenge failed, the actual activities work very well. So all that year, the kids organized a parent quiz night, a cake sale, an Easter egg hunt. They went babysitting and car washing in their neighborhood. They joined together and they went and packed bags in the local supermarket. Most of them raised their money. Um, parents supplemented because it was the middle class kids had been selected. They all got to Malaysia. They had a lovely time. They put the pictures on Facebook. Everyone was happy. So as a face-to-face -face activity based on local social connections, success, as a digital activity that connects this school with other schools, none of that happened. With the World Challenge, none of that happened. And the argument that um, Julia and I really wanted to draw out is that we're not, I think we need to think more about the way in which teachers and young people have a lot invested in um, staying uh, separate and not allowing for these further um, connections. And we need to think more about what it is that people are thereby invested in. So, for example, after a while, I began to get 
impatient. It's very uh, sometimes frustrating watching people make these kind of minor um, uh, problems in their in their lives. So we suggest I suggested to the teacher that she might set up a Facebook group because the kids were all on Facebook, and this would be the way to organise the World Challenge. And the teacher said, "Well, that was a very good idea, but she didn't really want the kids in her profile. She clearly had no idea how to set up a group that wouldn't give them access to her profile." I then went and suggested this to the kids. They said, yeah, sure, we have a Facebook group. That's how we organize all the stuff. <laughs> so they just hadn't told the teacher because they didn't want her in their lives. So the school can manage technology. It doesn't always do it. The kids can manage technology. They don't always let the adults in their lives know about how that works. What are people trying to protect? They're trying to protect their privacy, their authority on the part of the teachers. And the teachers are especially trying to protect the kind of influx of mess and muddle with which they envisage the home kind of coming to them through um, a flood of emails from teachers making um, all kinds of demands upon them. So I will um, skip one story and move to my conclusion. If you type connect or connections into Google Images, you get a lot of very, very happy. Um, connections is good, right? We all want to connect more. The colors are cheerful, the people are jolly, everything is productive. Um, all kinds of new things become possible. It makes you wonder why disconnection, which I think we saw in all kinds of ways through um, our fieldwork, is being framed in such a negative way, especially since many of the um, uh, critical scholars in our field are beginning to get quite concerned about the way in which connection goes along with surveillance and monetization and exploitation, standardization and instrumentalization and, and so forth. So we've um, ended up thinking about all the reasons why disconnections could be positive and connections intrusive, but also about whether there are ways of, you know, it's not that I want everyone back in their box entirely separated, can we rethink connections in ways um, that recognizes the interests at stake from the different perspectives of the participants instead of, as it were, coming in um, uh, in some of these uh, examples with a kind of top-down vision. So we concluded in terms of kind of three C's of the ways in which um, we saw um, uh, the, peop the children and the people around them managing. There's a problem with Dana.org. It doesn't matter, but I'm just telling you what the screen says. <laughs> it's, a good, it's a good message. There is a problem with Dana.org. Yeah, I'll let you think about that. <laughs> um, so the three Cs, so the dominant theme in a way that everyone was trying to negotiate was the, was the theme of competition um, and the kind of competitive individualism that Annette Leroux writes about in relation to this, the middle classes. Um, we could see very clearly spreading to embrace um, working classes, poor families, actually. It was very hard to put people into middle class, working class boxes now. So in fact, to all the different kinds of advantage and disadvantage, everyone was striving towards that competitive individualistic to some degree or other. And so digital media seemed to many families um, the route to do that, even though, of course, that is not the social justice vision um, that um, the Connected Learning uh, program has. Undercutting that, we also saw a lot of families doing what we various forms of conservatism. Um, I can say that here, I think, in Britain, I have to say, with a small c, nothing to do with the Conservative Party. Um, but I mean, as the parents feel those competitive pressures, they also feel the counterforce to kind of pull them back towards to resistance of the kind of onward rush of change, to find ways to shore up their traditions and reflexively kind of remember their childhoods and what it is that they want to um, instill in their children. Um, finding ways to evade the demands of of commercialism, remembering to value conversation, finding spaces for face-to-face -face interaction within the family, and finding tactics to um, avoid the extending reach of the digital. And digital media could be appropriated for those purposes as well. And they could be used as much to kind of put up barriers and build uh, separate, separate spaces, as it were, um, as, as they could to um, reach out. So the third, if the third C is connection, and we still think, and I still do think, that there are enormous benefits to be offered by 
building better or finding ways to build better connections uh, for children across the different spaces that they're in in order to share resources and um, extend knowledge and possibilities for um, action, then somehow we have to find ways that kind of respect people's conservative desires, which are really, I think, being stimulated by the competitive pressures so that we respect their um, uh, desires for spaces of agency and privacy and yet um, articulate better in a ways that really none of the families I've worked with were able to do. Articulate better really what are those opportunities that we think the digital age could bring for children to find new ways of living and learning. So thank you very much. Thank you, Sonia. And we have time for, we have 20 minutes now for Q&A. So um, do we have any? <laughs> we have a running joke that I'm often the first one to ask a question. <laughs> so I can ask it first and so nobody takes my question away. Um, this was a fantastic talk. And um, I feel like there are so many compelling ways that you've reframed, you know, threads of conversation and tensions in this field um, that, are, that are quite brilliant. Um, and so, you know, in particular, I feel like this idea that people are drawn to oh, comfort in much. the sort of instrument, instrumentalization, that's a big word, um, of the educational system because it gives them some certainty and, um, mm. uh, yeah, some comfort. But um, I wanted to hear more, um, as a researcher myself, about how you managed to get an entire class to be part of this study, um, how you got these families to let them into your homes, and um, how many people were involved. And so I just wondered if you could talk a little bit more about the nuts and bolts of the, the methods um, sure. and how you pulled this off, because it's pretty yeah. amazing. Happy to. I think the key thing is that I'm actually very nice. <laughs> <laughs> No, um, it was it was a it was a bit of a campaign, and I spent a year once um, we got the funding um, in a state of high anxiety because this was a all eggs in one basket kind of um, project. Um, we um, uh, so let me just think. So we kind of did a grid of schools in the we didn't want right in the centre and we didn't want terribly rural. So then we did a grid and we looked at demographics and um, achievement levels and. Um, paid some attention to distance because we had to be there all the time. So there was no point doing a school in Edinburgh when I live in London. So there were some practical constraints. And then um, within that, um, I introduced me, I didn't introduce Julian. So Julian is a media educator as well as an academic. And he has a lot of contacts with schools. And he has a lot of um, track record of being um, a reliable person to work with schools. And he brokered the first connection with our person who was the gatekeeper, who was the media um, education person in the, in the school. Um, we tried several and one said, sure. And then we went all anxiety to the head teacher to get that permission. And he said, you guys are crazy. There is nothing to see, but sure. <laughs> and then he said, but you have to get permission of the head of safeguarding. And the head of safeguarding who saw digital media means risk um, made us do a whole flow chart of what we would do if ever we caught sight of anything on a child's phone and so on. And that was their real concern. And that got us into the school. And we could sit in the classroom and we could kind of get and we could observe some stuff but we couldn't really talk to the kids so the parent teacher conference was crucial because what they very nicely did was the parents came in to talk to the teacher and she would say by the way there's these researchers over there can you go say hi and that was the personal moment when it mattered that Julian is also very nice um, and we just were human beings and we met them and then that allowed us to stay in the school for a time and to talk to the kids and then at the end of that, the kids were on our side and thought we don't bite. And that we asked them to ask the parents. And then we did another whole ethics permission thing about going home and going online. And then when we wanted to meet the friends, we had to do it all again because you can't talk to the friend of a child without that parent. So it was, it was a campaign and it took the whole project. But yeah, it, it was me and Julian. Um, part-time, we had a researcher um, helping with some coding. 
Yeah. If I had more money, I could have done. <laughs> <laughs> I, Sonia, um, I was really interested by your point where you were highlighting that the disconnect between the individualism and the cost of individualism uh, and the creativity that is involved, um, meaning that we assume that getting kids to be more innovative is something that actually opens them up. Uh, and this, I think, is part mm -hmm. of the challenge of a connected learning mm. ecosystem. But of course, it, it requires them to take certain kinds of risks, and who can afford to take risks? I thought it was really notable, and as you were laying out the pieces, between families who respond to the kind of risk structure by trying to put process, and mm -hmm. uh, what was this, Yusef? Yusef, Yusef. Yes. right, trying to put process, trying yeah. to formalize it, versus ones that are trying to open up mm -hmm. um, and trying to give more opportunity mm -hmm. and creativity. And the schools are being pushed more and more in that direction. Mm -hmm. And I can't help but think that there's a parallel here between some of the other dynamics that we're seeing in, in everything from healthcare and how health mm -hmm. is being constructed mm -hmm. to um, issues mm -hmm. of how we understand financial responsibility uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and personal ownership, that this creates this bifurcation. And I'm mm -hmm. curious, as you think about the class that you studied mm -hmm. and your broader study mm -hmm. issues, how much are you seeing these kinds of dynamics, both the connected learning, mm -hmm. technologically mediated components, but also the kind of logics mm -hmm. that have been so part of education creating bifurcations mm -hmm. um, that may be magnifying some of the inequalities that we've seen? Well, there's a lot in that question. Um, let me think. Um, I suppose in coming to kind of the, the, those who embrace the competitive, those who look for the conservative, and those who found possibilities for connection, that was our kind of overall picture. The, the, talk I haven't given is about class and social reproduction and really it cuts across it um, because what one wants to say about Yosef was that was a family that embraced the competitive instrumentalized model but not terribly successfully. Um, what I want to say about in the, in the book we have a, a chapter on how the kids learned music because music seemed to be the kind of learning that both opens up the most you know, when you see a child being made to practice their B minor scale or something, it's just, you know, makes you want to cry. Um, though you know that Beethoven is wonderful if they get there. Um, and when you see a child learning music by YouTube tutorials, you also kind of want to cry because you want someone to get in there and show him and help him. So the learning styles don't necessarily explain which ones take the children somewhere. Um, and people are, I think, adopting the different styles and the different possibilities given what, what they have to work with. Um, but for the most part, I think the ones that had the um, middle class advantages, whichever path they took, actually, it was kind of going to be successful for them. And what was interesting for the... You see, I can't call them working, working class because what we really had and what you have in an in a, in a area like that is you have um, people with high cultural capital but no money because London is so unaffordable that they're broke, but they value education and culture. And you have people who are uh, usually uh, first or second generation cultural immigrants who have a culture that um, doesn't connect well with others. So this is where I would kind of give Leroux's argument a spin and say, Yusuf's family, but or Fesse's, or plenty of others, could learn within their space, but they couldn't find ways of getting it outside beyond that. And at that point, you have to see that the school's system was a kind of middle-class imposition that the middle-class parents knew how to work. They knew how to have those conversations better with their um, in the parent-teacher conference. So there is something complex in the. The, 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 the styles of learning bifurcate, but how people manage to harness those to bring in um, benefits and opportunities is strongly class bound. But not entirely. And I have just been back, and you know, 28 kids, you can't tell much about social mobility, but I have just been back, and not everyone's lives are predictable, and not everyone is locked in a kind of iron structure of reproduction. Um, so there are some. Interesting science. But the other thing that, as it like, mm. relates to risk, that I can't help but think is the gap between what they're seeing in their home environment or the norms and what they're seeing in the school, and whether or not they can resolve that gap 
or whether or not they fall through it. Which is to say that kids for whom that gap is much smaller, it's not as much of a risk to be engaging in certain kinds of practices for when it is much wider. Well, I'm, I mean, analytically, I agree with you. But um, I think at 13 or 14, I mean, another story is a very patient man here. Um, uh, I think uh, another, another story is how at 13 or 14, they are, all of them, in a state of enormous tacit resistance about the expectations society has upon them. And so, you know, when you, you meet a 13-year-old and say, what do you want to be when you grow up? Which is the kind of, no one, they all become taciturn, actually. Two didn't. They were also interesting. But mostly, they are in a state of rebellion against that kind of expectation. But one middle-class girl who I kind of appreciated for her frankness said, I'm being really bad this year. I'm really messing around. I'm not doing my homework. I know it's going to get serious. I know I've got to meet my parental expectations. This is the last year I can mess around and you know, mm -hmm. focus on my nail varnish and my Twitter. And she was enjoying herself. But then she, she knew the burden was coming. Uh, uh, Philip Zimbardo recently published two books, uh, The Men Interrupted, uh, Men disconnected, arguing that uh, digital technology has a much greater negative impact on boys rather than on girls. Is your research supporting his claim? So let me get that hypothesis that the digital technology is supporting girls more than boys? Sorry, boys in, more in, than In negative terms, yes. Well, I don't know what my outcome measures would be, and I don't know when I would apply um, the test. Um, I wrote, we wrote surprisingly little about gender in the book, and there was a moment at the end of the first draft when we sat down and said, oh my god, we haven't got a chapter on gender, and we haven't written enough about it, and why does it all seem to be about class kind of cut through against ethnicity and culture? Um, so I would say um, possibly no. It doesn't. I mean, I could see ways in which boys were harnessing digital technology. Adam, he needed to play his games at that point in his life. His parents were pressuring him. He wasn't doing meeting expectations at school. He needed to go online and play computer games with people he didn't know. He probably won't be doing that in a year or two. And if I'd gone back two years later or five years later, the outcomes would be different. But at that time, he looked addicted to his parents. They were panicked about it. I just saw this is the space he needs now, and he'll come out of it. Um, I would want to tell 28 stories in answer to your question. <laughs> Thank you so much. I wanted to come back to the issue of the value of disconnection you yeah. mentioned. And I was wondering whether you just saw that in the choice of the children or the agency they were developed, or whether you would say that's something they actually had to fight for against coercion, the, the need to be connected, the, the you know, drive to be connected, or, or something like that. And also whether you see uh, distribution among separate individuals, because I've been organizing a uh, discussion with privacy professionals in Brussels earlier this year on the right to disconnect. And I was completely taken aback by the highly intuitive and personal responses I got from those people who all do that pro professionally. So I thought they would be reacting much more homogeneously to the idea of, of having value in, in this connection. But it wasn't the case. It was a very intuitive and personal matter for them. Mm. Um, I, I, I mean, as a side comment, I might say it's generally a problem working in this field that people have a very personal response to the work and they want to tell you about their children and um, how they feel with their phone and their worries. Um, so I feel sometimes like I want, uh, you guys have been very good, but I sometimes want a t-shirt that says, I don't care about your kids. <laughs> but <laughs> but um, because that's not what I'm trying to um, talk about. I don't want to say um, that the digital world is too much for young people and they want to disconnect. I want to conclude they want more control over when the technology connects them and how the technology can be used to disconnect them. So that's why I want to put the two stories together, both the desire to kind of use the phone just to coordinate walking to and from school so they can be together, 
which they would not have seen as a technologically mediated moment, though it was technologically arranged, but also how Adam goes on his game or um, Giselle goes on her Tumblr or Megan goes on her Tumblr, Giselle plays Minecraft. You know, they also disappeared into digital, all absorbing digital spaces to escape the fact that Giselle's parents were separating and um, Megan was expected to play her violin and Adam's parents were worried about his addiction. You know, so they had things that led them to escape through the digital, but they would also, when they were on their own, choose um, to be together face to face. Um, and I don't think any of it is, I don't mean that they're unconscious and unreflexive, but the way they do it is just through making it happen. It's just the way it turns out so that no one can point and say, you didn't go to your math teacher's blog and do those extra exercises because you're a bad person. It's just, I didn't realize, sorry, where's the password? How does it work? You know, it's, it's, a, it's a casual shrugging off. And I think that's about all that, there's not a lot more that 13-year-olds can do, um, but just kind of slide and evade away from all of these <laughs> demands. Thank you. We have five minutes and three questions, so we're a little ambitious in the time that's left. So, right, I'll try to keep it quick. First, uh, Sonia, I really want to thank you for um, the kind of contribution that I feel like you're making, which is uh, about you know re-complicating the notion of what kids' lives are with technology. And I find it's really interesting within kind of the connected learning and DML conversations that there's always felt like there's been these two discourses of people that are really interested just for the sake of understanding maybe what young people's lives are with technology. And I think Dana, I count within that group, and certainly you and um, Mimi in many respects, Mimi Ito. Um, and then, uh, people want to understand interest and agency, but then want to do something with it, right? The, the, that colonize the present in a certain respect is the negative view of it, but um, you know, rehumanize the mm -hmm. education system mm -hmm. is another view on it, which is mm -hmm. you know, we've had a deeply dehumanized education system that doesn't look to learner agency, learner interest in any real way. Um, and I guess you know you, you your contribution of uh, of recomplicating connection and disconnection uh, in this particular moment is is welcome. And I guess the the question I have is: so do we throw out the frame of um, using young people's uh, interest and agency as the starting point for how we think about the design of learning environments, um, or do we simply need to? Um, I guess find a middle ground. You know that uh, you know that visibility of a young people's interest in their part of their lives that's usually unconnected. Do we want to keep it totally disconnected? Do we want to say, well, let's let the teacher know just enough about that music interest so that they can, you know, productively build on that and recognize it and have that be actually the humanity of the child brought in, or do we, or and, and at the same time maybe. Um, not, not colonize the space that's private of the social interactions that that young person uh, has online with that music community that they just don't want their teacher in the middle of. So I guess, are, are we reframing interest and agency from the design of learning environments, or are we simply finding a middle ground? Uh, I don't know if that makes sense, mm -hmm. but I'm curious for your thoughts. I think the subtext was, how do we fix the education system? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> And I know Monica's looking at her watch. Um, <laughs> um, yeah, well, I suppose one ambition in um, doing this work was to um, try to say to teachers and parents, um, this, you're overloading too much on kids, and at the same time, you're not giving them enough choices. Um, and so maybe, just to answer very simply, um, I would like the teacher... Um, not to be told through some formal system that this child is learning music, but maybe to ask occasionally. You know, does she ask, is anyone here learning music? Rather than I've got a list here of who's learning music in the school, so they'll want to be in the school play in the band and everyone else is, you know, just, just asking more, recognizing children's lives are complex and they reveal different things and then not to seize upon it 
with the, the, the language the school used was of shining. Is there any way, they would say, fixing me with their beady eye, that you could shine in our school? And, you know, it just makes you want to clam up and say, I'm not going to tell you anything. You know, you're going to... So... <laughs> But that's because the teacher's being watched and she's being evaluated and the whole thing is, you know, and then the, the rankings of the schools across the whole country are. So we've built an edifice that's too big, really, to blame any individual teachers for. Um, but maybe just a little more flexibility and relaxing around some of the things 13-year-olds do and not putting it all in the school information management system. Sonia, thanks. I just have a, a small question about tertiary education and mm. how we as academics are constantly being pushed into this logic of standardisation and quantification and a lot of us who um, are older resist it a lot and I'm just wondering whether you think that the generation that is, you know, coming to learn and love this system, as you suggest... Mm. Um, I, like, my sense is management can't wait for people like me to retire so they can employ people like them who are coming through the education system who have been much more thoroughly disciplined into that standardised way yeah. that you talk about. What do, you, do you have thoughts? Or do you well, think it will swing I back away from procedurality? Um, I think one of, the, you know, one of the things that Mimi often said as we all got going on the, the work in the Connected Learning Network is these kids are going to grow up for jobs that haven't been invented yet. And how do you prepare them for those jobs and make them the kind of people who can... So one of the things that's happened alongside the transformations that led to that is that our societies have decided that, by and large, as many children as possible should try to get to university. And we could say that for a school, that's put a barrier between what is done in the school and the workplace that those children are going to that used to be, I think, quite a valuable corrective in some ways. The universities, we still have that. So... I see the universities in a way as resisting a lot of that standardization because we are more in touch with the employers and we know that they, the management of the university wants it, but the employers that we are liaising with and you know our alums come back and tell us they don't want it. And so we are, yeah, we feel like we're at the pinch point between the pressures, but we know also what we need to do. Whereas the schools have now just got to get them to university, and of course most won't get there, and then they won't succeed when they, but the school's mandate has changed. Um, because out there, the workplace doesn't want these products of you know, a highly managed instrumental system. And something's got to break at some point, because it isn't doing anyone a service, I think. I yeah. People are going to be employed as the future academics that actually will exceed. No, because we're not going to let them in. <laughs> 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 we're going to remember our values. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Did you have any final thoughts before we close? Ruth? Um, thank you for being a fabulous audience. I have enjoyed this enormously. Thank you so much. Thank you.